the latest of the book presentations that Torch holds every fortnight during term. <coughs> I am Richie Robertson, I'm Taylor Professor of German, and my time to be here is that with Nicholas Kronk, I co-organise the Torch Research Programme on the Enlightenment. I'm going to present the three speakers <coughs> and then fall silent. <coughs> the first and the author of the book we're going to hear about shortly is Jim Reed my distinguished predecessor, but one as <coughs> in the Taylor chair. Jim started out working on Thomas Mann. He wrote what is still the book on Thomas Mann some decades ago, and then, <coughs> a few years later, wrote out a book called The Classical Centre, Goethe and Weimar, 1775 to 1832. Since then, although staying loyal to Thomas Mann as one of the editors of the great term um, critical edition of the works, he has been recognised as an international authority on the work of Goethe and Schiller and Weimar classicism more broadly. He's published in both the authors and in order to clarify a word I use advisedly, the background against which they worked, he brought out in 2009 a little book in German called Neher Licht in Deutschland and a kleine Geschichte der Aufklärung a little history of the German Enlightenment, written in very accessible, punchy German, which Germans very much enjoy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the present book um, is an expansion of that, <coughs> published by Chicago, addressed to wide audience, and intended to draw attention to, to the existence and the, and the immense importance of the German Enlightenment. Jim will speak about his book, and then two colleagues will comment on it. First, uh, uh, Joe Wheelie from Cambridge. Joe is Professor of German at the University of Cambridge, but he is the historian in the German department. And refreshingly, he does not work on the Third Reich, but he knows a lot about it. His miti is political, cultural, and intellectual history, especially in the early modern period and the Enlightenment. He brought out, many years ago, a book, the, the, I think the Book of the Thesis, on, on religious toleration in Hamburg over a span of three centuries. And more recently, in 2012, he brought out with OUP two massive volumes in their <coughs> series on um, the history of early modern Europe, on Germany and the Holy Roman Empire. <coughs> this has also been translated into Germany, had a great success there as well as here, into German, had a great success in Germany as well as here. So Joe will present the point of view of the historian, and then the literary angle will be supplied again by Kevin Hilliard, who is tutor in German at St. Peter's, who done much work on a variety of 18th century writers, especially but not only Klopstock, also Goethe, Schiller, and many less known figures, and who brought out in 2011, a first great book entitled Free Thinkers, Libertines and Schwärmer, Heterodoxy in German Literature, 1750 to 1800. So I'll now invite Jim and then the two commentators to diffuse light in Germany. I don't know if you noticed, but the room that we're in used to be used for operations. And I'm just hoping there won't be too much vivisection by my two colleagues over there. Uh, until I saw the uh, circular again the other day, I hadn't realised I was going to speak before then. So all I'm going to do is say a few very simple things about the book on the assumption that most of you have barely heard of it and certainly not seen it. On the subject of seeing it, there are several copies over there. They're not for sale or even for borrowing. Um, uh, but you're welcome to browse afterwards. One of them is kindly provided by the organisation and the other three are provided by me. I just need to say, I think, why I wrote the book and what its point is, and all that, I think, is pretty clearly declared in the title, Light in Germany, Scenes from an Unknown Enlightenment. And I say in the introduction that that is only a slight exaggeration, the idea that it's an unknown enlightenment, because I think for the majority or even historically fairly informed and educated people, the notion of a German Enlightenment is not very familiar. 
And of course, given the weight of guilt and horror that attaches to German history as such overall, um, it is also not an expectation in many people's minds that there will be much light about at any stage in German history. So those are points I wanted to make, but there is a major intellectual enlightened tradition, a liberal tradition, a tradition of penetrating critical and analytical thought in the 18th century in Germany. I became interested in this subject really as um, an offshoot of literary, purely literary studies, which is what my original uh, profession was, and increasingly I became aware that the two things were not separable. But perhaps even more in German culture and other cultures, uh, the intellectual scene uh, influences and shapes the literary scene, and the literary scene contributes also to the intellectual scene. So this symbiosis um, between the two sides is the second, in a sense, the second point of my book. And in the introduction, I try to make the point of how many writers there are and how engaged they are in a variety of areas, not purely literary. But also the point that literature is, as it were, the high point of an enlightenment. It's the point at which the full humanity towards which the enlightenment was working can come out expressed in the best possible form. The book is not a systematic history, and so there are a lot of figures from the 18th century, uh, relatively minor or sometimes not unimportant, who uh, don't even get mentioned there. And I make no pretense that it's a history, and that's why I've given it that episodic title, Scenes from a, uh, an Unknown Enlightenment. Those scenes, nevertheless, do have some connection. Whenever I've written a book, I've always tried to make a run on from one chapter to the next so that the question that you end a chapter with becomes the topic of the next chapter. And I tried to do that uh, in this book so there is some connectedness. A second aim which became increasingly uh, desirable was to make Immanuel Kant accessible. Kant is the great figure of the German 18th century, somebody too little read because so much of him is too difficult, it is too difficult. But underneath that difficulty and behind it and motivating it is a fundamental commitment, which is very clear if you read his essays and his correspondence to the cause of the Enlightenment. He was one of the most enlightened men in his century across Europe. And the fact that he is less read than he should be seemed to me to be reprehensible. Without claiming to be able to understand any single or all the individual pages of the most difficult works, the Critique of Pure Reason above all, I am fully aware of what he was doing and why he was doing it and how those uh, difficult passages and those convoluted arguments in the end served the cause of Enlightenment. And if I've managed to put that over, I should be very pleased. Certainly a number of people who read my German book and one or two already who <coughs> read the English book say uh, Kant is the hero. Uh, and that is true. And it is an intention, and it's one that I'm glad people notice. The other thing about the book I hope is true of any book about the Enlightenment, and that is uh, one tries to emphasize the continuing relevance of the Enlightenment. Heaven knows, we only have to look around at the world at the moment to know how much is unfulfilled of the aims and wishes of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is unfinished business. And I've tried to make clear at a number of points, whenever possible, how my discussion of a thinker or a writer um, is dealing with themes that bear very much on what is still absolutely a set of live issues for the 21st century. So, in a sense, the book is also propaganda. I make no apologies for that. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. Um, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here, and a great privilege, really, to be asked to comment on, on Jim's uh, book. And I think, uh, Jim, you'll be relieved to, to, to know that I'm basically going to agree with you. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but, but um, say a little about why I think it's such an important book. Um, and also uh, perhaps to, to raise some questions which, which might be useful uh, in, in the discussion. I think it's a very welcome uh, book and an important one. And I think it's a book that uh, really no native German scholar could have 
uh, produced. It's extremely well written uh, for a start, um, and that I think is. <laughs> 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 um, it's it's a very good read, and I can't remember when I last uh, said that of um, uh, any German book that, that, uh, scholarly book that I read. Um, it's both scholarly and accessible. It's compelling uh, reading, and I read it. Uh, I've, one of the few books in recent months I've read every page of, so I did my homework, um, and I found it really engrossing from uh, start to finish. But there's also, I think, a deeper sense in which the whole drift of German scholarship has made uh, such a book uh, impossible, really, uh, in Germany. And there are three short points I'd like to make about that. Firstly, in German scholarly tradition, roughly from the mid-19th century to the mid-20th century, the Enlightenment of Aufklärung was really viewed as a rather dull and un-German period in German intellectual history, dominated by second-rate ideas imported largely from France. The really interesting developments took place uh, not in, uh, in literature, in his philosophy, from the 1760s onwards towards the end of the century, when writers such as Herder, Goethe, Wieland, Schiller, uh, and of course Kant, constituted the beginnings of what Wilhelm Dilthey called the German movement in German thought and culture. Secondly, after 1945, when the Aufklärung was rediscovered, and more precisely during the 1960s, German scholarship was enthralled to the new social history. German scholars now rediscovered Lessing, for example, but tended to steer clear of the big names of the later 18th century Goethe, Schiller, Kant, um, uh, and we're inclined to look, above all, at the social history of literature and ideas. Lessing was seen as significant precisely because his writings seemed to engage with the key themes of social and political transformation. Overall, the new social historical approach focused, above all, on the context in which enlightened ideas developed in Germany. There was a huge amount of research into what one might call the infrastructure of the Enlightenment in the German-speaking world, clubs and societies, publishing, the book trade, the development of newspapers and journals. And that, thirdly, had another consequence, because in the world of the Holy Roman Empire, social history approaches encountered a quite bewildering variety of contexts. So at a time when scholars in this country were beginning to think of the European Enlightenment in its national context, German scholars were increasingly looking at the Aufklärung in its local and regional context. It was often claimed to be uh, uh, an essential precondition for any general account of the Aufklärung, but in fact, in practice, almost no scholars dare tackle such a thing as a general account, and I think that remains true to this day. I can only think of one person in Germany, namely uh, Werner Schneiders, for example, who has written various short overviews including uh, one, for example, for the German equivalent of OUP's very short introduction series. They're useful outlines, but I think they tend to become rather breathless lists of people, ideas, media, and places. They're compendia, as it were, of information about the Enlightenment, rather than arguments about its ideas. Now we have uh, Jim uh, Reed's uh, volume, and I think it's a book which, furthermore, not only could a German scholar not have written it, but I think no historian could really have written it successfully, because it's clearly the work of someone who's immensely well-versed in German literature, German philosophy, and German language. And I think, in fact, the subtitle, Scenes from an Unknown uh, Enlightenment, is really rather modest in some way, because it suggests a degree of randomness, as it were, in the selection of highlights. And I think what, in fact, Jim manages to provide is what German scholars have failed to provide since the 1960s, a wonderful account of the key concepts of the Aufklärung and a good sense of how they developed from the late 17th century onwards, culminating, of course, in the great period that he focuses on in the uh, last third I think it's fair to say, of the 18th century. And while German scholars have tended to shy away from uh, the big figures, Jim uh, puts them firmly centre stage. And three in particular stand out. First, obviously, is Kant. Kant's essays form a kind of framework or starting point for much of the book. The focus on the essays and the other non-technical works as a commentary on the Aufklärung 
makes, I think, a powerful and convincing case for regarding Kant as the preeminent German Enlightenment philosopher against that German tradition, which always <coughs> wants to see Kant as a German idealist, as a thinker who somehow transcended or rejected the Aufklärung. And the second chapter of Jim's book, A World of Our Own and Epistemology for Action, I don't like the word epistemology, it's a bit too complicated, but uh, is in fact, I think, that second chapter, the best introduction to Kant's philosophy that I have ever read. And I have to spare the finding uh, an introduction to Kant's philosophy that would make sense to me over the years. But in clear and simple prose, Jim managed to explain not only the key ideas, but also why Kant expressed those ideas in such a difficult way. Why his language is so inaccessible to the modern reader. And at the same time, I think he emphasised very well the function of Kant's essays and non-academic writings as applications of his philosophy, something you don't get from uh, philosophical introductions to Kant, which focus on the, 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 the conceptual vocabulary and the ideas and, and scarcely mention the essays and the non-technical writings at all. For them, they're rather irrelevant, apart from the fact they all have to mention Francis Arfklum, because everyone's heard of that, <coughs> and the book on Kant wouldn't be complete without it. But Jim mentions not only that, but the whole run, as it were, of Kant's essays in which he commented not only, in a sense, on the world in which he lived, but on his own ideas over uh, the best part of two and a half uh, decades. After Kant, we find wonderful pages on Goethe and Schiller. And again, Jim wants to emphasise that we should regard them as enlightenment figures rather than exponents of some idiosyncratic uh, German anti-Western tradition. So we're introduced to Goethe as a scientist, as well as a writer and a poet, to Schiller as an historian, as well as a dramatist and as a philosopher. And a philosopher should be taken seriously, not just someone who dabbled, as it were, in Kantianism uh, alongside writing these wonderful plays, which again is an impression I could get from some uh, German <coughs> Germanistic writing. We also find, I think, illuminating pages devoted to Lessing, Herder, Alexander von Humboldt, and to a lesser extent, uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, Georg Faster, who accompanied Cook on his second voyage, and a host of others. And these <coughs> others include Frederick the Great of Prussia, who played such a role in Kant's thinking, but for whom, uh, as uh, Jim nicely says, the Enlightenment was essentially a leisure pursuit. I thought that was a nice put down after all the kind of a uh, century-long adulation of this great, allegedly great enlightened figure, and then, of course, uh, Joseph II of Austria, whom Jim presents really as the true philosopher king. If there was such a thing in Germany, I think your argument is, then that was him. What the book shows, in other words, is that Kant and his contemporaries ask questions about human beings and their capacity to create a better world, about belief, about education, about science, are still central to the world in which we live today. That made the German Aufklang every bit in, as significant, both in its time and for our present, as the more familiar French Enlightenment. I've had uh, a number of questions, but I thought I'd just throw them out now very briefly, and perhaps we can come back to them if there's, there's time, or if Jim is inclined to do that. Um, I two, I think, three uh, questions, uh, very briefly. Um, the end of the Enlightenment and its failure, a very big issue. When did your end, as it were, is rather indeterminate, end? Uh, and I think you're rather reluctant to say anything about, specifically, the end. We find German scholars talking about the Enlightenment expiring in 1790, for example. They're very keen to, to put a terminal date on it, but I think there's a, an openness there, which I think is interesting. Secondly, this is my perennial question of virtually any paper I go to listen to these days. What about the Holy Roman Empire? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, to what extent, for example, is it right to talk, as you do on page 19, I believe, uh, about petty uh, German states full of tyrants, for example, in a system in which higher courts of law were known 
particularly in the second half of the 18th century, for their tendency to intervene in such states and to depose tyrannical princes, for example. So although there is Württemberg and Karl Eugen is obviously a very difficult and problematic case, probably almost certainly insane, um, uh, a vicious dictator in all sorts of ways, but um, I think even at the time he stood out as an exception uh, to the rule. Many more were more amenable to uh, imperial intervention. There are particular reasons why Württemberg couldn't be intervened in um, in the 1780s. Thirdly, uh, the question of, of religion and the extent to which that uh, this hollowing out, I think you say, of religious belief, hollowing out of religion, this rejection of Christianity, to what extent does that reflect the uh, thinking of a relatively small elite um, uh, in a society that was still very much a, uh, a believing uh, Christian society, whether Protestant or Catholic, there were legal uh, ramifications for that, legal foundations for mm -hmm. the existence of those churches. And I think if one thinks of the longer span into the 19th century, religious belief doesn't disappear uh, in Germany. And I think an indication of how sensitive an issue this hollowing out of belief for the minority was is for me always the fact that Herder and Goethe, after all, famously fell out, I think, in the late 1780s, early 1790s, precisely or among other things over the question of uh, religious observance and whether or not the court wasn't setting a bad example, for example, to. Um, the, uh, the people at large. And I think in 1788 there was a famous New Year's sermon where Herder in front of the assembled dignitaries, including the Duke, Karl August, Goethe, and all the rest of them were there um, and expected to hear nice things about the New Year and, and how wonderful it all was uh, and got a complete blast from the pulpit about how disgusting and disgraceful the lifestyle of the court was and how they ought to mend their ways because if they didn't then Christianity really would be undermined and that would be the end of all civilised life in Germany. So those are my three questions which came to me again and again I think as I read the book and I'd just like to conclude with two very brief comments. Firstly Jim, uh, many congratulations to you on this wonderful book. And secondly, to all of you who come here to hear about the book today, please do read it. Go and buy it. It's terrific. Buy it. <laughs> <laughs> and although it's easy for me to say, because I've got a free copy, I, I believe it's not really very expensive. I about think £30. Pounds. About £30. Pounds, probably less on Amazon. Uh, uh, it's, it, it's, a, um, uh, a, it's a terrific book, and it will be a staple of the reading lists on the Enlightenment, I think, for many decades to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before you exercise your right of reply, um, let's, let's hear Kevin. Yes, <coughs> uh, when one is the last speaker in a series of this kind, one um, half hopes that the other speakers will have said everything that needs saying, and then one doesn't have to say anything at all. Um, and the other half, one hopes that they haven't covered everything, because that then, after all, leaves one something to say. Um, I think I do have one or two things to say, although you will be reminded of some of the previous observations in what I say. I think I want to start with what Jim just said a, a moment ago about propaganda. Um, uh, I think that that's right. I think one can find nicer words uh, for it. Um, one could call it an apologia. Uh, one could indeed retrieve a wonderful word from the 18th century itself, uh, the notion of a retong. Lessing uh, famously um, engaged in a series of retong and to try and save from the intellectual history some worthwhile cases who had been neglected or indeed vilified. Um, and I think that is what Jim is trying to do with the German Enlightenment. It is a retong of the German Enlightenment, an apologia. Um, it is written against the critics of Enlightenment. It's written against uh, uh, many who have written off the Enlightenment. Um, and uh, uh, not just the German Enlightenment. Um, of course it does that uh, prominently. It brings into focus the German Enlightenment. But it is also uh, a, uh, an apologia for Enlightenment, for the Enlightenment. Um, and I want to pick out one uh, argument that runs through the, the book surfaces at various points, but which animates, I think, the book as a whole. 
There are critics of the Enlightenment who criticize it for its disillusioning effect, for the Entzauberung der Welt in Max Weber's famous phrase. It's disillusioning effect. Uh, and there are those um, in a different camp, I suppose, who criticize it for its dogmatic certainty, its alleged dogmatic certainty about everything, about progress. Now, Jim uh, offers a very useful antidote to both of those um, claims. And it centers on his notion of hope, of the hope that is needed to avoid despair and defeatism about the state of the world. Uh, Mendelssohn is cited, I think quite rightly, for his somewhat defeatist view of uh, the state of the world. But I think the real target is perhaps not figures in the 18th century, but later figures who claim that um, the Enlightenment has a dispiriting effect. Um, at the same time, it's uh, uh, a criticism of those who uh, uh, allege that the Enlightenment is full of dogmatic certainty. Hope is not dogmatic certainty. Uh, various phrases that uh, leapt off the page for me. Georg Forster, caught in a tension contemplating the French Revolution, a tension between Enlightenment hope and historical gloom. Enlightenment's hopeful half-belief. Now that's a wonderful phrase. Hope, half-belief. Not dogmatic certainty, but half-belief. Or the idea of working to higher unknowns and desirable possibilities is <coughs> the algebra of progress. Lovely phrase, borrowed a metaphor from mathematics. Working to higher unknowns and desirable possibilities is the algebra of progress. So what does hope then mean, hope in history? One is reminded, I was reminded, perhaps uh, this was in the back of Jim's mind as well, of Hans Bloch's uh, work, Prinzip Hoffnung. Um, I think the clearest idea comes in uh, Jim's exposition of Kant's uh, essay, Idee zu einer allgemeinen Geschichte in weltbürgerlicher Absicht. There's, the argument is that in that essay there's a sort of virtuous circle is being set in motion. The idea that Kant invites us to entertain is that if we look at the world, we will find enough signs of promise in the welter of facts about history, many of them very dispiriting, but we will find <coughs> enough signs of promise in that historical welter of fact to uh, give us some hope that things might improve. That hope then in turn becomes the spur to make that promise come true. So it's a kind of uh, bootstraps exercise that we're being invited to engage in. It's not a march towards some preordained goal uh, <coughs> which tramples everything in its way. It's the active exercise of hope in history. And I think that's an important and very, very valuable idea. Um, the second thing I want to bring out from the, my reading of the book um, is, again, as an answer to the uh, critics who seem to have a very clear idea of what the Enlightenment is without actually being able to name anyone who actually subscribes to the beliefs that they uh, claim constitute the Enlightenment. Um, uh, step forward, uh, Max Horkheimer and Theodor Adorno. So uh, this book is full of examples. It's really just inviting scenes from life. It's inviting <coughs> us to have a look, have a look. A gallery of interesting and inspiring cases. The book, I think, does in fact have two heroes, two main heroes, many interesting figures, two main heroes. Kant, with whom it begins, and Goethe, with whom it ends. Now, of course, in a book about the Enlightenment, it's not surprising to find Kant. Um, many new and illuminating things are said about him, but in a sense, his presence in the book is not in itself a surprise. The real surprise and the stroke of genius in this book, I think, is to include good, to bring him under the heading of Enlightenment. That is the, is the key Schachzug, the, the strategic move in this book. 
And Jim then brings together Goethe and Kant in a wonderfully illuminating way, in a way that illuminates both of them. Kant's, and <coughs> I'm quoting Jim now, Kant's abstract, Goethe is Kant's abstract ideal of human potential made flesh. Uh, very wittily, uh, wit is another great feature of this, of this book throughout, very wittily Jim says that uh, uh, Kant's um, sapere audi, of course taken from Horace, but Kant made it his own, sapere audi is, uh, uh, is placed alongside Goethe's lived equivalent, the esse audi, uh, dare to be, or slightly more, less aphoristically, they have both measured out the human span and accepted the limitations of living within it. So, if you bring in Goethe into this, it turns out that the German Enlightenment isn't that unknown after all. We know Goethe. It's just that we haven't thought about him. Uh, we haven't been uh, uh, habitually thought about him as an Enlightenment figure. And that is the great thing in the, in the book. Once you see Goethe as an Enlightenment figure, it becomes blindingly clear that there is such a thing as the German Enlightenment. So I think those are two uh, features of the book and many other things I could mention that I thought were admirable about the book, but those are the two things that I just wanted to present to you today. Okay, thank you much, Richard. And thank you both for extremely kind um, comments you made on, on the book. Um, and I think nothing uh, damaging enough to, uh, to sink it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the... Um, uh, Notion first of all, if I can take Joe first and then Kevin and Joe's points in order. Uh, the end of the Enlightenment, when did it end? In a sense, it has never ended, and thank God for that, or thank some higher power. Um, um, there is the Enlightenment, and I make this point in the very beginning of the book, before it even has a text, just about usage, that I use Enlightenment with a capital E and Enlightenment with a small e. Enlightenment with a capital E is a reference to a movement, an historical phenomenon. Enlightenment with a small e is a reference to a phenomenon of more general application and indeed a necessity. Um, so it's never ended in that sense. And, and when I talk about it, very briefly in a late chapter about its later, later fortunes, I do mention uh, a number of writers who represented light in darkness when Germany did go through darkness. Um, the Romantics, in a sense, started the attempted destruction of the Enlightenment. Uh, strangely enough, the German Romantics, quite unlike the English Romantics, or indeed I think the French Romantics, um, philosophically very sophisticated and educated people who nevertheless um, attacked ideas of rationality uh, and wanted to replace rationality with something allegedly deeper, though the definition of what it is that is deeper is never very clear. Um, and from the Romantics, the anti-intellectualism, which is a major German tradition, gets lower and lower until the nadir of Nazism, but it is traceable back to the Romantics' resistance to clarity and rationality. Um, so the end, in a sense, is the Third Reich, and one doesn't like to keep coming back to the Third Reich, and I agree it's nice to have a German historian who works on something else. Nevertheless, it is the thing we know a certain historical m movement goes towards, whether you think of it as a Zonderweg or not, it is where 20th century German history ends up. So that you've been asked of a radical question, where was light then? Um, that tradition, of course, has been overcome by a subsequent political phenomenon, the Federal Republic, which is, in a way, uh, as any decent democratic society, is um, an embodiment of uh, Enlightenment ideas. One could write a whole book on the anti-Enlightenment. My little German book, which is over there in case anyone is interested, does actually have a, a chapter on resistance, opposition to the Enlightenment, but there isn't one in here. The nearest thing to it is the attack on Ranke and Hegel at the end of the chapter, Hope in History. Yes, there's a lot to be said about the Holy Roman Empire, at least there would have been if Joe hadn't written these two magnificent volumes, uh, which are pretty well exhaustive, I guess, uh, and perhaps the Holy Roman Empire doesn't get enough of a positive shout in my book. Uh, quite a lot of the rulers do. I do single out some very nasty rulers, and I single out one or two really rather decent chaps um, including um, Franz of Anhalt Dessau. Um, uh, Wurttemberg, incidentally, was intervened in by the Viennese court, um, uh, at, quite specifically, apropos uh, Karl Eugen. 
Christianity, Joe's next point. Uh, yes, of course, criticism is by an elite. I wonder if criticism is always by an elite. Serious intellectual criticism involves work, it involves knowledge, it involves clarity of mind, and certainly two of those things um, are not often found together, and all three very rarely. Uh, I do at one stage say that, um, of course, Christianity can, continues, uh, we know that, uh, but I put it in rather rude form, that it had the bottom knocked out of it by the 18th century, but things do continue without a bottom. Uh, to exist and to, uh, to inculcate practice. So it continues. It continues largely because of people's inability to, or un lack of interest in the analysis of metaphysics and by the force of authority and the force of custom. And that's true now, as it always was. Herder, of course, was not a very uh, extreme Christian. I mean, he was a pretty liberal Christian as these things went, though he was quite right to say nasty things about the court. Goethe, of course, also says nasty things about the court, though mostly only in his letters. Um, one or two people uh, have objected to the strength of uh, the anti-religious element in my book, well, in the German version. It, the rumour hasn't gone around much yet about the English book. They had been religious people themselves and they were worried about it and they thought I was being too hard on religion but in fact I was only reflecting particular analyses and particular ideas that are found in the Enlightenment concretely. And I'm glad that Kevin uh, pointed out, um, that, and you both pointed out, that my book is concrete. It, it deals with particular cases, <clears throat> texts, individuals and arguments and to that extent is meant as a repost the only possible academic repost, the awfully vague and prejudiced things that are said dismissively about the Enlightenment by people who clearly have not read the texts written by Enlightenment writers. Uh, I stick to the idea of propaganda. After all, uh, the word goes back to the Catholic, um, de propaganda fidei, um, on the propaganda of the propagating of the faith, and I am engaged in the business of propagating a faith, but it is a rational faith. The Enlightenment, of course, is always, and I'm glad Kevin picked that point up, is always provisional. When it talks about progress, it's not asserting it will happen, it's only asserting it will be a good thing if it happens. And hope is precisely the capacity for seeing a possible future that is better than the one we have, heaven knows, very relevant this week. There is a lovely book art quotation, which I virtually I think it's the last thing in the book, which is uh, meant to illustrate how far... The Enlightenment is from dogmatism. The Enlightenment transformed the world of the mind without any individual having to sign up to anything. It is essentially a movement of intellectual freedom. Uh, as for the dismissals of the Enlightenment, it's always been difficult to answer unspecific accusations of this, that and the other without textual reference and without any kind of attempt to uh, enter into the arguments of the Enlightenment and so this really is just meant to be a, a kind of uh, concrete demonstration that there are other ways of thinking about the 18th century. Well, thank you.